Give us some context before we get to Isaiah chapter 40 this morning. The Bible says in Isaiah 1, the first five verses, that during this particular time, in God's people in their history, King Uzziah was reigning over God's people at that time. And in that first chapter, if you remember, Lord, let's the key verse in that chapter, verse number 18, Isaiah says, come now and let us reason together. That was always God's constant call to mankind to reason with him. And then we see in Isaiah 2, verse 1 and 2, the Bible there lets us know how Isaiah is going to give us that prophecy concerning the Lord and his coming kingdom. In Isaiah chapter 12, we read there about uh, God is the God of salvation. Uh, he is Jehovah, our strength and our song. The first 39 chapters of this book more or less is about judgment and condemnation. God's people in 722 BC were going to go into Assyrian captivity and some 18 years later in 740 uh, is where we're going to find in Isaiah chapter 40 this morning. Again, those first 39 chapters was about condemnation and about judgment. And so in Isaiah chapter 40 here, Isaiah here is going to more or less uh, change the picture He's going to give them a message of hope. Though you have been in captivity, uh, though you have been condemned in a land that is not your own, God will one day allow you to go into your land. And also Psalm 137 also attests to that uh, later on in their history with Babylon. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 25, the Bible says, To whom then will ye liken me? Or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who have created these things, that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by name, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one failing. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speaketh, O Israel? My way is here from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard? That the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young man shall utterly fall. Then he says, contrary to belief, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Again, these particular verses are in the context of Isaiah giving them a message of hope. Again, the first 39 chapters here, Isaiah is constantly letting them know there is nothing you can do about your current situation. You have rebelled against God. You have disobeyed God. God told you to go to the middle and you want to go every other way. God says, Isaiah says, it's nothing I can do about that now. But one day God is going to allow each of you to go back home unto your homeland. And I believe that's a message of hope for all of God's children this morning. Because sometimes we look at what is We look at how things are instead of what they could be and what they can be. God is telling this people through the prophet Isaiah, if you wait upon the Lord, you're going to be able to renew your strength. Key in with me on verse 35 again this morning. The Bible says, to whom then will ye liken me? Who can we compare to the God in heaven? Again, when you look at God's resume and you look at everything God has done for humanity, who can compare to the God that we serve? And the simple answer that, and the, and the answer to that question is simply no one. We shouldn't compare anyone to the God of heaven, but sometimes we do. He says, to whom then will ye liken me, or shall I be equal, said the Holy One. If you recall in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 3 and 4, as Moses is on top of Mount Sinai receiving the instructions from God, 
that were eventually going to govern his people. In Exodus 23, 4, God says what? Have no other gods before me. But again, this was one of Israel's biggest problems. They loved idolatry. They loved to worship golden calves. Now, many say, well, Josh, let's give them the benefit of the doubt because for 430 years, they have been in Egypt. And so they were accustomed to worshiping and to bowing down to false idols and false images. If you remember in Exodus 32, as Moses is making his way back down from the mountain, the Bible says he picks up Joshua who was halfway up the mountain. And the Bible says when they get down to the base of that mountain, what do you find? The children of Israel bowing down to a false image. Bowing down to something that cannot lift their burden, that cannot change their problem of sin. And we say, and we say sometimes, you know, how dare the children of Israel to bow down to a false image. But you know what? We do it every single day and don't even realize it. As I like to say in terms with the children of Israel, their idolatry was mental, but today ours is mental. We would, we, we, we would not dare bow down to a golden image. We don't see that today, but you know what? We will bow down to people. We will bow down to the things that we love and the things that we care for. And those things may not be wrong any of themselves because God created everything for our good pleasure and for our good will. But anytime something comes before God, it is idolatry. Anything that takes the place of God, anything that takes the place of God ruling over our lives, next thing we know, that thing is going to become our God. Well, how do you know that? Because when you read the Bible, and when you look at humanity's existence, humanity has always wanted to bow down and to worship something. But why would I want to bow down to an image? Or why would I want to bow down to, to just something that tomorrow it may be gone? When I can bow down to the one who created all of that, the God in heaven. He says, to whom then will ye liken me, or shall I be equal, said the Holy One. He goes on to say, lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who have created these things. It's almost as if Isaiah is writing exactly what David said in Psalm chapter 8. David one day went outside, Psalm 8, also Hebrews chapter 8, Hebrews 2, 1 through 8 talks about that as well. It's as if David went outside one day. And David looked up at the stars and David said, God, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? When you look at Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 and all the things God created, what was the crowning achievement of God's creation? It was mankind. It was humans. And so the Bible says in Hebrews 2 verse 9, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of man, crowned with glory and honor that we, he might taste death by every man. David said, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the prophet Isaiah is more or less saying the same thing. Lift up your eyes on high and behold who have created these things. You know, sometimes we uh, spend a great deal of time outside, and sometimes if we just look up at the clouds, it's mind-blowing. If we go out at night and we see the stars in the sky, how can someone create something so perfect and so beautiful? God can. How can he give us something so perfect whereby we can live our lives? He gave us the church, and the church is perfect in every way we look at it. God knows each of the stars in the sky. Church, if you try to go outside at night and count all the stars, I believe you'll probably miscount probably by after 20. But yet God knows every star in the sky. God knows every individual on earth. Isn't that mind-blowing to you that God can know every single person he has ever created all at the same time? Many of us have a very difficult time remembering someone we met maybe, maybe even a month ago. My God. God is able to know everyone there is to know. 
And on top of that, you take 7 billion people in the world. All of those people has a need and have a problem. Yet God is able to help 7 billion people all at the same time. Who else can do that? No one but the God that we serve. But in 1 Samuel chapter 8, one of Israel's biggest problems and ultimately what leads to Isaiah writing chapter 1 through chapter 39. In 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse number 7 especially, if you remember there, they told Samuel, your sons, they no longer walk in your ways. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations. And what does Samuel do? Samuel turned his attention to God. And Samuel tells God, the people want a king. And so God tells Samuel, hearken unto the voice of the people. Just give them what they want. For they have not disobeyed thee, but they have disobeyed me. You see, I don't come to church because I don't want to get in trouble with the eldership. I come to church because I want to see Jesus. And I want to go to heaven. And I think sometimes we look at things from the wrong perspective. We look at things from the wrong viewpoint. Instead of looking at what I can get out of God, God is looking at what he can get out of us. And I believe that is the perfect illustration when we're talking about prayer. Prayer is not always about what we can get out of God, but what God can get out of us. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5 verse 7, casting all your cares upon him, for he, God, cares for you. Isaiah says, lift up your eyes on high, and behold, he hath created these things, that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by name, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one faith. The Bible goes on to say, even the you, well, the Bible goes on to say in that particular context, he is the everlasting God. The Lord, the creators of the ends of the earth. When you think about the end from the beginning, who knows how who, who, who knows the outcome of something before it even originates? God. As I like to say, and I say it all the time, there are two people on my team. It is me and it is God. Now, sometimes I don't always know what I'm doing. Many of times, most of us, we don't know what we're doing. But at least one of us do. At least God does. Because sometimes as a human, we get so caught up in our emotions and our feelings. Well, God, why isn't this thing or why isn't that thing working out? God, I'm doing everything you tell me to do. God, I'm faithful to you. We talked about a couple weeks ago, Job more or less had the same cry to God. And so the Bible says he asked for a meeting with God. And God recorded that. And God re. re we, and, and, and God gave him that meeting. But the Bible says once God had a conversation with Job, he just put his hand over his mouth. You know, church, I encourage you this morning. You may want to humble yourself before God does. Because when God humbles you, it will wake you up. You see, Christianity is not a sprint, it's a marathon. If you remember, the Bible says in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, see and we are compassed. The Bible speaks volumes about patience. See and we are compassed with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and sin which does so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that has been set before us, looking unto Jesus as the author and finisher of our faith. He says in James chapter 1, beginning with verse number 1, James, a servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith, it works patience. God is the everlasting God. He's a patient God. He's a long-suffering God. 2 Peter 3 verse 9 says that. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I'm tired. I'm faint. How do I keep going? God will give you the strength to keep going. The Bible says in verse 31 of Isaiah chapter 40, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You know, when you read the Bible and you read 
and you read about God's interaction with mankind. Just when you think, sometimes when we watch movies, just when you think the main character is about to die, the plot just suddenly changes. And not only does he live, but he accomplishes whatever he has set out to do. Here you have God is about to destroy the world in Genesis chapter 6. And the Bible says only eight souls were saved, 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21. Just when you think the story is about to end with humanity, God makes a way to save Noah and his family. You see, very often we like for God to work when we tell him to. Kind of like our cell phones, it's kind of like how we treat God. We expect our phones to do exactly what we program it to do. When we hit the call button, we expect our phones to make a call. When we're texting someone, we expect our phones to do that. Why? Because we pay good money for it. And sometimes we kind of treat God like that. We kind of dial into God and we want him to answer us immediately when we call, yet we won't do what he tells us to do. And so we text God and we plead to God, God, I'm texting you, I'm calling you, but you know where to be found. Where are you? It's just like when you read in Exodus chapter 14 and 15, Moses, you led us out here just to die. Moses, if you wanted us to die, we could have just did that in Egypt. We didn't have to come out here to the Red Sea and just for you to kill us, just for your God to kill us. Moses said, stand still and be quiet. Sometimes we talk too much. Sometimes we think we know everything. The children of Israel, they always thought they knew more than God did. They always thought they were five or ten steps ahead of God. They had no idea what they were doing. And so the Bible says Moses just takes his rod and he allows the children of Israel, by the help of God, to go in on dry ground. Here you have in John chapter 11, the Bible says Jesus comes to Bethany where Lazarus had laid. And the Bible says he had been dead four days. The Bible even adds this phrase, he stinketh now. He had been dead four long days. What am I trying to say here? Mary said, well, Martha, Jesus, if you had been here, my brother had not died. And Jesus had to tell her more or less Lazarus had to die so God could be glorified. And the Bible says after those four days, he said, Lazarus, come forth. Imagine that scene. The man you saw dead four days ago is now walking around Bethany as if he never died in the, in the first place. But you know what? That's how it is once you're introduced to Jesus. That's how it is once you're converted into the body of Christ. Because we can be walking around 20, 30, 40 years spiritually dead. And the next time someone sees us, it's as if we we're a whole new person. What changed? Meeting Jesus is what changed. I'll tell you that much. Here you have Saul of Tarsus in Acts chapter 9, persecuting the Christians, persecuting the Lord's church. Imagine, be, imagine being one of those Christians Paul persecuted and seeing him walk into heaven. Imagine that scene. This is the same man that persecuted me. This is the same man that wanted to kill me for professing my Christianity. Now Paul is walking in heaven. What a scene that'll be. Prophet Isaiah said, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. You see, that's why prayer is so important with the child of God and his relationship to his God. In me praying to God, I give to God what's bothering me. And God, in terms, give me his peace. That is going to be okay. Philippians 4, uh, verse 6 and verse 7. Verse 6, in the peace of God that passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Again, the Bible says in 1 Peter 5, verse 7, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. I heard an illustration once, and I always thought it was, was, was so fitting for that particular verse. Casting all your cares upon him. It's as if you're taking a bowling ball, and you're just rolling the ball down the lane. That's what it is to cast and just let it go. But what do we do? Sometimes we like to run after the bowling ball. How foolish does that look? 
But that's exactly what it is when we try to take back from God what's bothering us instead of just giving it to God. Here you have these people in Assyrian captivity and they are tired. Many of them, the Bible says, even the youth shall faint and be weary, verse 30, and the young men shall utterly fall. Here you have all these young men, all these people who once had all this strength. Now they don't anymore. They've been discouraged and they want to quit. But the prophet said, if you wait upon the Lord, you'll be able to renew that strength. You shall mount up with wings as eagles. You shall run and not be weary. You shall walk and not faint. Are there blessings if we're faithful to God? Absolutely. These people in Isaiah chapter 40 were troubled. How are we going to get out of here? How are we going to get to a better place? God will give you the strength to get there. The Bible talks about in Romans chapter 8 verse 24. For if a man sees something, what does he yet hope for? You know, I've never in my lifetime seen heaven. I have no idea what it looks like. But I can't wait to see it. And the Bible over and over again continues to give us this constant call to mankind. Don't be faint in what you're doing. The Bible talks about in Judges chapter 6 through 8 how Gideon, here he is just faint. Here he is just tired. And God tells him, get up thou mighty man of valor. And as a result of Gideon standing tall, as a result of Gideon going out ready to fight, he inspired other men to want to do the same thing. Paul says, let us not be weary in well-doing, Galatians 6 verse 9. For we shall, we shall be rewarded if we faint not. Isaiah in this context is letting us know this morning that God will give us the strength. But see, God is not going to help us if we don't first help ourselves. Many believe that, well, because of the doctrine, once saved, always saved, uh, that once I'm baptized, I kind of let's just go into cruise control until I die. There's no way to live. There's no way to do it. Isn't it much more exciting going through life with God than by yourself? I'm sure many of us who are outside of Christ can especially raise our hand on that one because we have seen how destructive sin can be. We see how it is to live under the pressure of the world. But God is telling us, come, Hebrews, Matthew chapter 9, verse 28, come unto me and I'll give you rest. If you're not a Christian this morning, why not be one? Again, God will give you the strength. Well, is Christianity easy? Absolutely not. Is it difficult? Yes. Will it cost you something? Yes. But God also will reward you for that. This morning, we encourage you to hear the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Paul says, So well, then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Being willing to believe, according to Hebrews 11 and verse 6, that without faith it's impossible to be pleasing to God. Being willing to repent of your sins, Luke 13, 3 and 5, I tell you nay, but if self you repent, you shall all likewise perish. What's next? The unit says, see, here is water. What does the enemy to be baptized? He was ready after the preaching of the gospel. And the preacher said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And the Bible says that man, that day, that hour was baptized for the remission of his sins. The Bible says the spirit of the Lord called the preacher away. And you can be like that man this morning. He went on his way rejoicing. But what happens when I mess up? I'm not perfect. No one is. But Jesus. The Bible says that we confess our sins. Notice what he says about the character of God. I especially use that verse in terms of the plan of salvation. But that verse also gives us some insight into the character of God. He is faithful and he is just. To forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We encourage you this morning, if we can help you, please come while we stand and sing. Just as I am.